Hello, I'm Major Nodja Bobby, Vice Chair of the Christian Evidence Society. Welcome to Questions of Our Times. Today's question is, can the future ever be green? In 2009, the private emails of a group of climate change scientists at the University of East Anglia were hacked and published online. Accusation of data manipulation followed and climate change deniers had the supposed evidence they needed and years before the term became commonplace, they accused scientists of promoting fake news. The climate gate controversy was born. One of those climate scientists is my guest this evening. And so here to talk with me today about the environment and climate change is Dr. Mike Hume, Professor of Human Geography at the University of Cambridge. Mike, good evening. Welcome, good evening. it's lovely to see you. Thank you. Mike, what is your, you, you are Professor of Human Geography, which, which might, for some of us, need a bit of explanation. What is your professional interest in the environment and in climate change, and as being a Professor of Human Geography? Yeah, well, it's a, it's a lifelong uh, or a career-long interest, uh, I should say, in, in the sense that I started studying geography uh, way back a long time ago uh, as a student. And as part of that uh, programme uh, of, of study, I became increasingly interested in the uh, notion of climate and its changes. This was 40 or so years ago. Um, <clears throat> and I pursued those interests uh, at a time when Climate change was certainly not the sort of issue that we understand it to be today, but it just fascinated me. It, it grabbed my attention and I went on to develop a career initially in geography and then I moved into climate science and did a lot of work uh, on the scientific evidence for a changing climate uh, and pursued that in, in relation to uh, other disciplines that were studying the problems of climate change. I'm back now uh, in my own original home discipline of geography uh, as a professor. Uh, and the interesting thing in my title here at Cambridge is Professor of Human Geography, uh, which in indicates that my interests around this idea of climate change have moved uh, over the course of my career. I did a lot of work earlier on on the scientific evidence, but increasingly in the last 15 years or so, I've become much more interested in trying to understand this phenomenon of climate change as it interacts and intersects with a full range of human, social, cultural and political and religious worlds that we see around. And so human geography is a catch-all description really to try to describe that approach to my studies, to my inquiries, to my writings. Um, so but the motivating thing right the way through here has been my fascination with, with this idea of climate change and trying to understand exactly what it is and how it impacts upon us. So the science looks at the data, whereas the, the geographer looks at the impact on, on, on people uh, of, of that of that possible outcomes of that, what happens if that data is, is, is true? Is that the way you, is that a fair analysis? Well, that would be a starting point, I think. And, and certainly <laughs> a, 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 lot of my, a lot of my early work um, was indeed looking at meteorological data, um, mm. uh, records, meteorological records, ob observed records that go back two or 300 years in some parts of the world. Obviously a, a huge volume now of new observational data that's coming in from remote sensing and satellites and instrumentation, uh, and then connecting that data with how climate scientists seek to simulate the Earth system in computers, so computer modeling. Uh, and, and one of the tasks is to see, well, how closely aligned are the trends in the observational data about climate with the simulations that are coming from computer models? Obviously, you want a good degree of alignment in the observational data if you're going to have any faith at all yeah. that these models are telling us anything useful about the future. So that was a lot of the work I, I used to do, um, very much all in the, in the tradition of, of, of scientific analysis. Okay. Speaking of science, then, in recent months, and uh, it's almost a year now, isn't it, uh, we've heard that we must follow the science. <laughs> 
Okay, this has been the, the government's message. We, every decision that we make that affects the human geography of uh, the UK population is determined by following the data that the science is, is, is bringing to the table. Um, Climate Gate, as, as I said earlier, was one of those occasions when the data that scientists were unearthing was accused of being uh, false. So how scientific is the concept of climate change and what is your response to those who deny it? Well, again, the, 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 there are a number of different parts to an answer here, I think. I, I mean, first of all, there's, there's no doubt that as scientific inquiry uh, over the last one or 200 years has, has developed and expanded, that we have been able to collectively as a, as a global community of scientists been able to be very clear and very confident uh, about what the observational data are telling us uh, about the state of the, the world's climate, whether on a global scale or if we come down to more regional scales like the UK. Um, and that understanding that is data-based uh, and interpreted by scientific theory, uh, and a lot of those theoretical underpinnings of the science you know, go back to quite fundamental physics, um, how moisture, matter, and energy circulate around the atmosphere. Um, I think these are all pretty well established and well attested yeah. uh, claims about the changes in climate that, that are happening. And very importantly then that human activities on the planet increasingly becoming dominant are altering many of those climatic processes. So the, the basic shape of the science here is is pretty clear and, 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 and pretty solid. Um, and, and I think the you alluded to some of the challenges and skepticism that has been expressed uh, in some quarters. And, and I think it's important to, to, to put that into context. I mean, science, science is a form of inquiry into how the physical world works, is innately skeptical you know, we as scientists are called upon to ask questions, to challenge our colleagues, to interrogate the data, to seek out errors, to uh, modify our uh, assumptions or our hypotheses if the data tell us something different. And that's a, 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 a deep instinct of, of critical skepticism that scientists possess. Um, and I think when the criticisms came, uh, particularly around the climate gate, but on other occasions as well, um, those critics were playing to this long-standing instinct of scientists to be critical of their own work, but accusing us of suspending that critical sense. Uh, and, and some of the claims were, were very precise and deliberate, targeting some of my colleagues that there was deliberate manipulation of data, there was fabrication of evidence, there was suppression of contrary evidence and so on. And wasn't, very, wasn't, was, very, wasn't the word trick used as well? The, 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 the word trick the was there. That, that, you, that you were tricking the public. Uh, yeah, it was a colleague of mine also called Mike, um, who, 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 so it was make, Mike's, Mike's nature trick uh, was, was a phrase that circulated around. And trick in that sense was being used quite innocuously in, 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 in the sense of a trick being a very smart, form of statistical analysis, not a trick in the sense of being deceptive. Um, but it can very easily, uh, uh, of course, point to a different implication, which was these scientists talking about climate change were somehow conspiring together to pull the wool over the eyes of the yeah. public or the politicians yeah. um, for reasons that at times were, acu were accused of um, <clears throat> all sorts of nefarious uh, reasons we were on, on, in the pay of green organizations that we were mm. trying to uh, line our pockets with millions and millions of dollars of research funding, uh, many, many uh, um, disturbing challenges, I think, to the integrity of science. Most of those accusations following inquiries afterwards were found to be groundless. But I think what it did do for me, um, it points to this very unstable relationship, let's call it that, between science 
and the publics, if you will, that yeah. engage with science. Um, it's not as a, a, a stable or it's not as a simple relationship where science or scientists make a discovery and they communicate that to, to, to different audiences and the audiences um, simply absorb it into their cognitive or their psychological or emotional lives. Actually, the relationship between science and the communication of science to different public audiences is much more complicated um, because we as human beings actually are much more complicated. We're not just automata or blank sheets of paper waiting to be written on by scientists. You know, my, my fellow citizens come to engage with scientific claims and scientific evidence with their own convictions about how the world is or how the world should be or their own beliefs and their values. And we need to understand uh, those citizen beliefs and values and mm -hmm. intuitions mm -hmm. if we really are going to allow science to do what science is good at doing. And, and I think the, the whole climate gate episode taught me that on occasions, climate scientists hadn't been very good at, at listening to uh, different public audiences. Yeah. P public perception, you, you mentioned there, and public engagement with science. And, and uh, I mean, you, you describe uh, science as, scientists as being sort of necessarily skeptical. You, you have to have the evidence. And, and in some sciences, you have to have the, well, mathematics in particular, you have to have the proof. Uh, you, you want things. You can't just take it because so and so said so. You have to prove these things for you or evidence these things for yourself. Best possible an explanation, I think, is the uh, the term that you often use. But public, the public has a concern that is beyond. It is compl It is complex. You know, they have a concern beyond care for their planet. They also want employment. They also want purpose in life. I mean, we have a situation now in the UK, as you know. This year, the UK will hold, for, its, for the first time, the UN Climate Change Conference. A hundred miles to the south of Glasgow in Cumbria, the government is planning to build the first coal mine in the UK for 30 years. How does a politician work out the long-term benefits of climate change against the uh, requirements of the public for employment in an area that obviously needs employment. Yeah, I, I mean, this, this example that, that, that you uh, brought to our attention is, is, is a very good example, of course, of the messy world of politics and of decision-making, which is a very different world than the world of scientific experimentation or inquiry or observation. Yeah. Politics is not science and science is not politics, although the two do get entangled undoubtedly, but they are not the same enterprise. Mm. Um, and I think this is a case where actually the slogan, just listen to the scientists, or mm. we as politicians will follow the science, doesn't really cut it because mm. there is no scientific analysis that tells you whether you should or should not open a coal mine in Cumbria. Yeah. What, the scientific evidence here about climate change is, is showing is that the more carbon dioxide that we emit into the atmosphere, the greater the rate of change in the climate system will be. That is what the scientific statement is. It doesn't actually tell us whether we should continue to increase our emissions of CO2 or whether we should cut them to zero. That's not a scientific conclusion. Yeah. Yeah. That's a judgment that different people will make based on a whole variety of reasons that are political and ethical and moral and social and, and cultural. But the science doesn't tell you whether this coal mine should or should not open. So there's a limit to what science can tell politicians. And so I personally, I'm very skeptical whenever I hear this slogan in the mouth of a, a politician or a, a, a campaigner, well, we're just only following the science. Well, no, you're not. You're doing more than that. You're bringing yeah. your own judgment to bear on what the scientific evidence is. In 2017, President Trump, following the science or not, withdrew the United States from the Paris uh, Agreement on Climate Change. 
On taking office back in January, uh, one of the first acts of President Biden was to kickstart America's re-entry. Tell us, please, what is the Paris Agreement? What does it say and where does it sit in the history of global responses to climate change? Yeah, so the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, to give its full title, um, uh, negotiated in 2015, it follows uh, really, I, I think, an earlier agreement, international agreement, um, that people may have heard of the Kyoto Protocol, which was signed in 1997, which was the first major international agreement about climate change. The Kyoto Protocol was a very limited, it had very limited engagement from the world's nations. It was really only a small number of industrialized nations that took on any obligations or responsibilities to start reducing its greenhouse gas emissions. The difference with the Paris Agreement from 2015 is that uh, every nation has signed up, well, with the exception, I think, of six um, nations that are very, very small and have got complicated reasons for not uh, signing. But every nation is a member uh, or a signatory to the Paris Agreement. The difference here being that the Paris Agreement is based on a, a set of voluntary commitments by national governments. There's no top-down imposition of what a particular country has to do in terms of reducing its emissions. By a particular date, it's a, more of a bottom-up agreement that individual nations uh, can make their own commitments to. Some going more fur- further than, than others, of course. Um, and in a sense, that that arrangement, what is called the architecture of, of the Paris Agreement, is one that many commentators have said was essential if all of the world's nations were going to sign it up. Yeah. Um, there had to be this voluntary. Uh, element to it. Nevertheless, it does provide a framework for countries to uh, consider what their own responsibilities here should be. And every five years, there's a uh, an intention to recommit uh, new intentions from countries. Um, so the, the, the conference that you alluded to before, coming up in November, the end of November this year in Glasgow, is the latest in an annual cycle of meetings where the Paris Agreement uh, gets examined and looked at and uh, new commitments uh, are brought forward by uh, individual nations. So it is important, um, and it's important as well that America, uh, I think, has come back into the Paris Agreement under Biden. Um, On the other hand, the Paris Agreement on its own actually doesn't have teeth. Um, And so we we shouldn't somehow think that just because the Paris Agreement is in place, well, that solves the problem of climate change. Even with America back in, it doesn't solve the problem of climate change. Well, coming to that, the figures say that in 2019 was was the worst year on record for greenhouse gas emission. By contrast, 2020 was the best year or lowest year of of greenhouse gas emissions since the Second World War. Obviously, that is... uh, impacted by by the the restrictions of of coronavirus uh, pandemic but as as the world sort of eases back from lockdown if if we carry on business as usual how realistic is it that the aimed for reduction in 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 global temperature uh, that is um, stated in in the paris agreement how realistic is it that we'll ever get get to that figure and meet that target well, my, in my judgment, it's probably it's a long shot. Um, I mean, the Paris Agreement uh, puts a range between 1.5 degrees of warming and 2 degrees of warming. We, we shouldn't exceed that range. 2 degrees would be the upper limit. This is 2 degrees warmer than the, the 19th century. So we're now around about 1 degree warmer already. So it's a pretty tall order to rein back human emissions of greenhouse gases uh, so rapidly that that limit will be reached. Um, it's not impossible, um, but I think it's a tall order. N- not necessarily because nations I- at some level of deliberation or judgment don't want that to happen. I think even with the best intentions, though, there is what we might call lock-in or inertia in our Global, uh, first of all, our global energy infrastructure, which over the, the previous 150 years, of course, was very largely developed around fossil fuels, oil, coal and gas. But also in, in all of our other 
infrastructures that support modernity um, and the expectations of increasingly large numbers of planetary citizens to enjoy a particular standard of living. And, and it's, it's easy for, for, for us in the West to forget that there are still billions of people on the planet who do not enjoy what we would regard as the very basic uh, yeah. elements of uh, a, 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 a good level of provision uh, to meet basic human needs, uh, whether it's food, education, health, or, or energy. Uh, or, or even mobility, clean water. Or clean water. So yeah. um, it's easy to forget that. And, and, and I think because of, because of these underlying reasons, the, 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 the lock-in of our energy infrastructure, the quite understandable aspirations for billions of people to improve their quality of life hmm. and the, um, the inertias in our infrastructure, it's going to be a tall order to turn some of these trends around on the timescale that the Paris yeah. Agreement would imply. Uh, I mean, that, we, we can talk later maybe about w whether that's too pessimistic a reading. Um, different people will read this differently, but I think it's a tall yeah. order. You're talking about the, the energy structure, which is still very much, despite other people, other efforts to go green and to have renewables, it is still fossil fuel, isn't it? How, how realistic, how economically viable is it? to to switch from fossil fuel to green energy that will still give the west the same standard of living if not better and the the emerging nation as you rightly say do not have some of the basics that we have how are they going to improve their um well-being without resource to to fossil fuel yeah i i i think you know the the, the the conversation it has to start with, with full recognition of how committed the world is still currently to fossil-based energy. Around about 85% of the world's primary energy is still linked to coal, oil, and gas. And that's despite, uh, over the last decades, you know, very rising, rapidly rising rates uh, of penetration of certain renewables, uh, mm. wind and solar, into some countries at least. Uh, so yeah. But there's an awful long way to go. Many of these new technologies are becoming competitive uh, and there's certainly a growing set of measures, both hard measures and soft measures that are likely limiting the growth of coal-based, particularly coal-based. But um, <clears throat> there is still a, a, a long way to go here. Um, and I, I think it's important also to recognize the difference between energy and electricity. So, for example, a country like Britain, you know, Britain is actually getting much closer towards converting all of this electricity generation to being non-fossil. So whether it's, yeah. it's hydro, nuclear, wind, solar, a little bit of tidal perhaps coming along. But electricity isn't the full story because there's all the additional energy that is required for space heating and for mobility um, uh, Heating our, heating, our, heating our homes, uh, getting ourselves around the place. So even if you got close to 100% renewable electricity, that still isn't getting it to 100% renewable energy. Yeah. So to what extent, I mean, we've talked about the aspirations, uh, people's aspirations around the world. We, we started our conversation talking about uh, the science and the human impact, uh, you know, the human geography as well as, as the data. So to what extent is the solution something about human behaviour rather than something that technology that can deliver? Well, I think, I think this, is, this is a really important question. It gets very close to the heart of, of many of the, what we let's call them the green debates. Mm -hmm. um, is, is the problem here that humanity as a whole, or particularly the more advanced uh, and consumptive parts of humanity, are living off the planet beyond the level that the planet can sustain? Hmm. Or is the problem actually that by accident or by design, 
200 years ago, we realized just how versatile and cheap fossil-based energy was. And so we just in, in gone down a completely the wrong road in terms of technology. Um, you know, I, if, if, you know, take a hypothetical example, if 200 years ago, you know, some, some in, in, incredible uh, scientists and engineers had, had been able to harness the power of the atom to nuclear fusion, <laughs> 200 years ago, we would never have gone close to oil, coal, and gas. We'd have been able to produce all of our energy needs with very, very little environmental impact. Uh, and, and so this question wouldn't have arisen. So is the problem here just a technology problem? Or is there something else going on here, which is about uh, either the number of people on the planet, and, and of course, some people will argue that actually there are just fundamentally too many people on the planet, or is it the fact that there are too many people, particularly in rich countries, who are just consuming far too much? So I think how you answer this, this question really reveals an awful lot about where you see the problem lying. And therefore, of course, what type of solution you might favor, whether we just need another push on technology innovation, whether we actually need to rein in our consumptive instinct, uh, or whether we just need to put all of our efforts behind uh, measures that can limit the, the, the human population on the planet. Um, I mean, I, you know, I, I'm not going to prescribe what I think. I mean, I'm not sure there is a correct answer here, but I think it's the right question to, to really dig into how people think about the problem. Yeah. And exploitation, the use of fossil fuel and you know, chemical uh, physical resources of the of the world of the earth it's easy to justify if if you don't own any moral if you see there's no moral responsibility if the world's here for my benefit then why shouldn't i use it so where does the moral imperative to save the planet come from well i, I think i i would perhaps offer three lines of thinking here. I mean, at one level, it, it might be very functional or utilitarian. You know, the, 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 the basic <laughs> argument would be, well, we need to preserve and to protect natural systems because those natural systems provide us, me, you, us, collectively, humanity, with the basic uh, uh, resources that are necessary for... A worthwhile human life. Sometimes these are referred to now as ecosystem services, the services that are provided to humanity by ecosystems. So at a very functional utilitarian level, well, we need to keep these intact for our own survival. Uh, others would, would take a, a different line and actually say, there's something deeper though. Um, it's not just a, a, a functional argument because many of these natural ecosystems or species, the creatures, the animals, the sentient beings, some deep ecologists will even go to the, to the rocks themselves, as having intrinsic worth, intrinsic value that has got nothing at all to do with human need. Uh, and that we should therefore, you know, we should protect the blue whale, mm. not because of what the blue whale gives to us, but because the blue whale deserves to be um, kept alive and not yeah. made extinct. So in, intrinsic value. Um, and the interesting thing is, where, where does that notion of intrinsic value come from? For me as a Christian, I, the way I would approach this actually would, would put those two together, that for me it's both a, a combination of functional utility and intrinsic worth. But for me, the intrinsic worth emanates from God as a creator who made this universe, this creation, made myself, uh, to be something special and important and valuable to God. And, and so my responsibility then emanates from God to respect that creation that he made. So as a, as a Christian, therefore, I bring these two things together. The functional utility is that I'm concerned about my neighbor, yeah. um, you know, my, my, my neighbor in, in parts of the world that, that needs resources in order to live a worthwhile uh, human life. So as a Christian then, to what extent is the natural world itself evidence of the existence of God? I think for me it's 
an important line of evidence. It's not, I don't think it ever can be decisive hmm. for an individual. But I think for me, the way I think about my Christian faith and the foundations upon which that faith is grounded, the natural world is important. I have to think where, not just where have I come from, but where has this universe come from? And the universe, what is the, the, the poem, I think, Jared Manley Hopkins, the, 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 the world is, is filled with the grandeur of God. Um, where does this sense of grandeur, of beauty, of awe, when we look at some of the aspects of our planet and of the universe as a whole, where does that sense come from that is very deeply rooted in my intuition and instinct? Uh, it doesn't prove God, but the narrative of a creator God that thought about the world, the universe, and designed it into being, created it, breathed it into being, and I am part of that, that narrative makes sense to me. Um, I mean, there are other lines of evidence as well, I think, that, that play into to a belief in a personal creator God, but, but I think the natural world is certainly an important line of evidence that can't be just casually dismissed. Yeah. Um, so when so when you look at you know the beauty of the planet when you look at a, a scar a, you know a star filled evening you sense something within you a, a, a wonder and an awe a kind of there must be something other than the little old me yes and 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 as a christian i i would imagine that you your worldview is informed by a biblical perspective of, of creation and of the, of the world. Can you, could you outline a biblical perspective of the natural world and, and humankind's relationship to it, responsibility maybe towards it? Yeah, I've mentioned one, one element of this, which, which is that we approach the physical universe that we are part of as God's creation, that it emanates from an intention, a, a, a design and an intention and a being who was able to bring that design and intention to fruition. Um, and we are part of that and we um, appreciate uh, that. And indeed, if you read Genesis in a particular way, then there is a responsibility uh, on the part of, humans, human beings, to, and we can use different words here, to steward or to care for um, creation. Uh, and, and that's a responsibility that, that, for me, does point to human exceptionalism, at, at, at the very least in this regard, in the sense that a, a beaver or a buffalo, I, 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 I cannot come to accept that a beaver or a buffalo has got that sense of a moral responsibility yeah. to care for the environment in which they find themselves. Mm -hmm. They may have other instincts and intuitions, but it's not the sort of reflective moral responsibility that, that I recognize myself as having and something that has been given to me by, by God. I think the other part of a biblical reading, um, and this may be a little bit more more controversial, or at least a little bit more worth a discussion, is that this stewardship under God is not a responsibility to preserve creation intact. Hmm. It actually is a responsibility to develop the world that we find ourselves in that God has made. And so there's a development imperative, I think, given that humans have this creativity, this huge creative potential uh, um, to work with the material resources of, of the planet. And I think that's a God-given responsibility as well. And so development uh, is also, I think, part of our, our responsibility, not to think that the, the world somehow, that, that it was 100 years ago or 500 years ago or 10,000 years ago is somehow the world that we've got to return to 
if we're going to fulfill some divine mandate. Um, so, so we're not we're not museum keepers. We're not museum keepers. No, we're developers. We're innovators. We're experimenters. Uh, and I think the idea of experimentation is a is a nice metaphor to to think about human responsibility. Um, and, and, and sometimes you... those experiments will 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 prove wrong or prove to, to be a bad idea. But sometimes those experiments um, are, are, are fruitful and, and amazing and, and, and astonishing. And would you see that that um, ability to experiment and develop and wonder and try and improve? Would you would you wrap that all up in the concept? of what Genesis talks about when it says that humankind will have dominion over the world? Or is dominion about treating the world as you please and do not worry about the consequence? Yeah, well, this word, word dominion, uh, translated into English at least uh, from the Hebrew, has, has caused all sorts of problems over the years theologically. Um, and some, of course, famously have accused Christianity itself of promoting the rape of the planet um, because of this particular reading of the word dominion as one that gives unfettered power uh, and desire for, for, for mastery to, to humanity uh, at all costs. I, I don't think that's, I mean, I'm not a theologian. Um, uh, you can ask Roe Williams next week, I think, who's your guest about this. <laughs> he, probably, he probably reads Hebrew much better than I. But my understanding is that the Hebrew word here actually has got a, an ambiguity in it. It can, it can both, on the one hand, mean to stoop down, um, as well as also can mean to rule over. So uh, uh, maybe that ambiguity you know, gets a little bit closer here, that, that you know, we, as humans, we do have exceptional creative abilities in order to, to rule over or to, um, to create and to alter. But we do that by stooping down. We do it, as it were, by listening to um, the ants uh, and the trees mm. in, in an attitude of humility and of deep respect for the ants and the trees because they are equally just as important a part of God's creation as we are. So. I, I, I think I, I, you know. I think dominion has got a bad a bad press, um, and I think a full reading of scripture would make it very clear that the sort of dominion implied there is not an aggressive, careless, self-serving mastery of the planet. It's a much more humble disposition. We could talk another time about whether we should care for the bats who gave us COVID as much as we should care for each other. But before we go to the viewers' questions, just, just let's go to the question of the night. Can the future, Mike, ever be green or have we already passed the point of no return? Well, a simple answer is, is we have not passed the point of no return because I'm not actually sure what on earth that point would ever look like. Hmm. I mean, I know one trope of, of people in, in increasingly in recent years talk, campaigning or talking about climate change is it's, it's too late. Or if we don't act in the next six months or six years, it's too late. I, I don't recognize this, this notion of being too late. Um, uh, and, and I always respond by saying, well, it's never too late to do the right thing. Um, yeah. and, and the idea of being too late also... It, it obscures, I think, the much bigger picture that I try to paint um, uh, in, in, in my work, um, which is that dealing with climate change is not just about hitting a particular temperature target, um, because there's something else that actually matters much more than just that. If it was just a case of hitting a temperature target, we actually could do that pretty straightforwardly by spraying the atmosphere with particulates to mimic volcanoes. I mean, this is an idea actually already being thought about and, and experimented actually on very, very tiny scales. But we could easily do that. And we, we could just cap the temperature at two degrees by mimicking volcanoes in the, in the atmosphere. Um, most people would not think that's dealing with climate change properly. Mm. 
So there's something else at work here. But it's not about just too late to hit a temperature target. It, it, it's actually about attending to many of the inequalities, injustices, uh, and destructions uh, in the world in ways that are sensitive to the climate, yes, but can't just be reduced to climate alone, I would say. So yes, it, it's always possible to be greener, to be more respectful than we are. And no, it's never too late um, to do the right thing. Thank you. Right, let's see what people are asking. Because they've been listening very carefully to us, or to you rather, not to me. <laughs> and there are lots to get through. So quick, quick fire, if we can, please, uh, without, uh, without being simplistic, of course. Um, this uh, question says, at a local level, what actions would you recommend? Before you answer, interestingly, I came across today a church in, um, I think it's South Malden, in, in, in South Malden, I don't know, I can't remember, South Malden in London, they are actually having a fast. They're, they're having a Lenten fast whereby every day um, people are encouraged to do something which would consider the impact of climate change. It could be, you know, saving water. It could be walk instead of taking the car. So there are people who are trying to do things. Uh, there are Christians who are trying to, to do things. But the questioner here says, what actions would you recommend? We understand the principle of act local, think global, but what do we need to do, please? Many people care, but few know what to do with it. Mm. Well, I, I mean, the obvious things are, are, are things that have been rolling out certainly in our country. Uh, I mean, the, 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 most, the most basic is to ensure that you're recycling as many uh, of your uh, waste materials as you, as you possibly can. You know, local authorities have made that easier than a generation ago, but there are other means and mechanisms that one can use to do that and living more lightly on the planet. Whether, whether or not it, it stops climate change, in, in a sense, is neither here nor there, but living lightly on the planet, I, I would argue, is a, is a sensible and a good thing to do. Um, I, I think also local, local churches or individual Christians can and should be involved in local decision making. Um, it, it's important for Christians to take an active and present role in civic society uh, at all levels of decision making. Um, and, so, and so I think that also here is, is something that should be encumbered upon Christians. Thank you. Uh, a very similar question, variation on the theme. What one meaningful sacrifice might people in the developed world make to help with climate change. Less central heating, giving up ca cars, moving for, <laughs> I can't even say it, moving to vegetarianism. Is there one, basically, is there a silver bullet? Well, there isn't a silver bullet. I mean, different people will pursue different of those options. Uh, and I think it, it, it would be wrong to instruct people to do particular things at a population level. I mean, that, that you're then living in a, in a society that is, is micromanaged um, yeah. by some central powers. <laughs> there is no silver, silver bullet here. I think each, each person, each Christian, certainly should look at their own conscience and decide, you know, to make some particular choices um, uh, that, they, that they can make sensibly within their constraints um, and to pursue those with integrity. Hmm. Mentioning Christians there, uh, a, a viewer set, suggests or states, uh, I'm not sure the evidence, but there are a great number of Christians, specifically in more evangelical brands of faith, who deny climate change. Do you think this is a problem with certain types of religion, or is there a more fundamental, is it a case of a more fundamental issue of education and of respect for the planet? Are the climate... I, are, yeah. Are some Christians climate change deniers? Oh, and yes, they are, just as there are some non-Christians who are as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, you know, in some quarters, evangelical Christianity has got a bad press, particularly in parts of America. I, I, but I don't think there's anything in, inherent within a, an evangelical reading of, mm -hmm. of, of the Christian faith that, that requires people to be climate skeptics, not at all. Um, and I think the American case, I mean, there are very peculiar cultural politics at work uh, in, in American culture um, that, that don't really replicate themselves 
faithfully in other parts of the world. Um, but it's certainly the, the, the case. I mean, I would argue that a, a, a good Christian theological, biblical uh, reading of God's relationship with the environment and our responsibility for it really points in one direction and one direction only, and, and that isn't climate denialism. Yeah. Well, speaking of biblical viewpoint, again, a viewer asks tonight, how do we integrate biblical eschatology, that is teaching about the end times of the world uh, and the return of Jesus, uh, into our understanding of the future of the planet? Yeah, and, and again, this has been a, a, a dividing point uh, amongst some Christians because of their different interpretations of the end times. Um, all, all I'd say is, is, is for me, uh, however I might read or <laughs> speculate or be convinced by how an ending of this planet comes about, in no way does that suspend my responsibilities before God to care for his creation. Um, I, I, you know, it, it, if I knew that the world... Uh, was ending in, in, in 10 years' time, um, I would have just as much obligation to care for my neighbour and yeah. to care for my environment as if I knew the world actually still had another 10,000 years to go. Yeah. Um, so I, that would I, be true. However you read it, I don't think it alters or suspends that, that obligation yeah. to God. And would it be true if that was your personal 10 years or the planet's 10 years? <laughs> Um, yeah, no, I, I, I don't think it would make a difference. Um, no. uh, Population, it, it, sorry, big one. Yeah, if we, if, we, if, we, if we understand our responsibilities under God, then they are responsibilities under God for as long as we are on the planet, uh, or indeed as long as Christians live on the planet. Um, I, don't, I don't think that's, a, that's an issue. Yeah. Population. You touched on it very briefly, um, but uh, a couple of very similar questions. I'll try and I'll try and put them together. Some commentators, such as uh, Sir David Attenborough, have called for a reduction in the human population for the benefit of the environment. China's one-child policy uh, would, if a, if more widely adopted, would also uh, reduce population and would potentially benefit the environment. Is that the sort of thing that you would see as viable? Would do you agree with that kind of curtailing in some way the human population? Curtailing sounds rather drastic, doesn't it? Um, my sort of, my word, not theirs. Sorry. Yeah, but and, and but I think this is partly part of the, again the reason why this becomes such a, a lightning rod issue. Um, but for, for for many people, you know, because people are very wary of direct impositions. Hmm. Uh, or containment of, of certain human freedoms here, as, for example, exercise in China with the one-child policy. Um, uh, I'm not sure anyone would be advocate, or I certainly wouldn't be advocating for that. On the other hand, uh, I, I do find it interesting to, and I, I, you know, I sometimes pose this question to my students <laughs> about what is, the, what is the, the, the underlying driver or the imperative for procreation? Um, why, why, why do people have children? And actually, one of the, the, the reasons, certainly in, in many of the developing, with still very high population birth rates, is the point I mentioned before about the lack of basic life chances yeah. and uh, human yeah. welfare. The best, way, the best way to slow down the growth of population is not to do China's one-child policy or to start sterilizing women. The best way to do it is to educate women, is to give them... Uh, the best possible life chances early on for girls and young women um, to reach their full potential as human beings. And that is proven to be the best break that we can put on future rises of, of population. And, and that draws our attention, of course, to another thing we haven't mentioned tonight, which I think is in integral to thinking about environment, which are something called the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, yeah. that have... Uh, female education in particular, uh, inscribed right at the very heart of them. Thanks, Mike. Um, right, 
I change change the tap once again. What are your views on hydrogen? Perhaps that means hydrogen cell in cars or f- fueling cars or vehicles by hydrogen and tidal energy, bearing in mind we are an island nation, as replacement for fossil fuels. Yeah, well, I think that there are many uh, potentially very exciting technologies uh, that around beyond just solar and wind, of course, has made huge progress in recent years. I remember actually as a, as a, no, I was at high school back in the 1970s. Uh, I, I remember you know, people may remember Tomorrow's World, the BBC program. I used mm-hmm. to watch that avidly as a, as a teenager. And uh, back in the 70s, people were talking about tidal power uh, in Britain. Uh, and, and I thought at the time, hey, brilliant, this is a wonderful way of get, getting electricity. And I still think that. Um, and, and I think I do think we should be pursuing uh, tidal power in a country like Britain. Um, and, and I think actually my approach to thinking about technology innovation here is captured in the idea of a portfolio approach, that, that, that we really should be pushing on as many different levers as we possibly can here. It, 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 it actually, we're not going to get away from oil, coal and gas just by focusing on solar and wind. We actually need to have a much broader portfolio of technology options uh, if we are serious about decarbonizing our energy system. Uh, And for me, that includes nuclear, it it includes hydrogen, it includes uh, uh, tidal, geothermal, uh, and and so on. So I think a portfolio approach here is, is, is essential if we're serious about dismantling the fossil based energy system. The concept of costing the earth um, is perhaps behind this next question from from a viewer tonight. Is it possible to have continuous economic growth and protect the universe? Sorry, protect the environment. Oh, you can protect the universe. I don't mind. (laughs) So Um, can we keep can we keep wanting to get richer, increase our GDP and at the same time protect the environment? I I would be sceptical of that if if we if we define GDP in the way we define GDP at the moment, uh, which is actually quite a narrow definition uh, Mm. of of the market value of exchange goods. Um, And and I think I'm with those who argue that in an ideal world, in a better world, we should have a much more expansive understanding of wealth um, that includes natural capital. uh, and we get away from just this very narrow uh, definition uh, of, uh, of GDP as through the um, market value of exchange goods. Uh, and, and I think if we, if we expand our understanding of wealth, then I think it is possible for societies to become wealthier while still retaining the integrity of, of the natural environment. Because in a sense, we will then have embedded the integrity of the natural environment into our measures of wealth. So it, it avoids the contradiction that we observe happening in our world today. Keeping, keeping GDP as we currently measure it at 2% per annum or whatever for the next 100 years, I, I would find that very difficult to see how we can do that and retain the integrity of the natural world. Mike, well, the last question for the evening. Um, you, we have been talking about climate change as being a global problem. Uh, and the, the, the questioner almost hints that there's a, there's a global answer rather than a, a national or even a personal one. I would really like to hear how Professor Hume thinks we can utilise the human condition and the shared experiences that unite us to connect and work together to protect the environment. 60 seconds, Mike, what's the answer? <laughs> well, I, I, a, good, a good starting point for working together, whether it's in your family, or your school, or your community, or the world, is to listen. It is to listen to other people and to listen to their experiences, uh, their life experiences, their life histories, but also their stories of how they envisage a good or a better world. Because if you don't listen to what other people think, then you're never going to find the possible bridges or meeting points where their world coincides with yours. And if we are going to cooperate, as I said, in your family, let alone the world, we need to find those bridging points, those common, common beliefs, common convictions, common aspirations that allow us to start working together. It doesn't 
doesn't solve everything. We, we know in our families it doesn't solve everything. But it gives us a better chance of attending to some of the dysfunctions, whether in our families or whether in the world. So I would start off by listening, listening to each other's stories. Dr. Mike Hume, Professor of Human Geography at the University of Cambridge. We have enjoyed listening to you, sir, tonight. Thank you for your insights. Thank you for your concern, personal and professional, for the environment and for making us aware of what is at stake.